4,919,755. What's in a number? Well, we know that's a big number, but it's also so abstract. What's in a number? I would say everything when your loved one is reflected in that chart. How do we convey the weight of this number? We are all impacted by this global situation. We've all had loss, lost health, loss of a loved one or colleague, economic hardship, extreme stress. We've all suffered. And at the same time, we've been held away from each other by social, social distancing, missing our ways as human beings to replenish and comfort each other by not being able to be physically together. The pandemic has made us, forced us to question all of our assumptions. Who are we as a people? How are we doing in this greatest challenge of our time? We're all sharing in the same global event with all our own unique perspectives and experiences. How have you grown, changed? Where will you be when all of this is over and we emerge on the other side? Will we have a brave new world? Will sharing a global calamity provide an opportunity to bring us together in a way that nothing has before? The theme this year, compassion, culture, and courage, is intended to be touchstones in this journey to our brave new world. What's in a name? Brave New World. Oh wonder, how many goodly creatures are these here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh, how brave new world that has such people in it. This is Shakespeare. I, and I actually do believe that when I look out at the ASTMH family and all the amazing, talented minds dedicated to making the world better, safer, healthier. In the case of this quote, however, the speaker's misguided and not understanding the nature of the scene she's seeing. And it's this misunderstanding that inspired the title of the book, this science fiction book by Alex Huxley in the early 1930s. The book shows a fear that's pervasive today and still relevant. A dystopian future, society, science run amok, babies cultivated incubators, predetermined to fill certain roles, everything controlled, no free will. This is what people fear in science. The robots taking over, humans being enslaved, changes by science and things and people they don't understand or trust. And this is our challenge. The fear of science and misinformation that has now become commonplace is the biggest threat to our health and security. I wanna remind you of a quote from Bill Fahey, science does not have a moral compass. That's where we come in, that's our job. Put the science to good use and service of the people. So how do we communicate? How do we communicate what we do? Where do we turn? Where can we learn? How do we share what we do better? That we are all in this together. I wanna share with you some inspiration and some ideas that have come across this last year or so that I think have some things to teach us. It comes from a, some unusual sources two lawyers, a car salesman, a Swedish physician, and a spy. The sum of us. <clears throat> One thing the pandemic has taught us is that we're all connected. For some, this brings up deep fears. It's inspired nationalism and racism and violence. I, however, wanna share with you a beautiful thinker, Heather McGee. She's a lawyer. She's also a self-described Econ economic policy geek. And she has a new book, The Sum of Us, S-U-M, and it's brilliant. It introduces the concept of the solidarity dividend. This challenges the concept that's very per pervasive, the zero sum game, that there is a winner and a loser in all interactions. And if I win, you lose. And if you win, I lose. This means I don't want you to win because that would somehow imply that I lose. This has led to policies and practices that hurt everyone. The institutional racism that brings down everyone in the process. The idea of the solidarity dividend is that we all actually do better when we work together. 
the analysis she does to understand the policies that have been the underpinnings of systemic racism that many of us have inadvertently participated in without our knowledge or understanding and how those policies have hurt us economically and socially. Most importantly, it gives us hope that through understanding and shining a light on these policies and how they have hurt us, we can change and achieve more and receive the solidarity dividend. She digs deeply into policies and US culture, demonstrating a deep and persistent courage through this exploration to look and learn and show that our shared show us our shared history that's been hidden from us. For me, this analysis is very helpful not only for understanding US policy, but also in understanding some of the legacies of colonialism and how they similarly may hold us back in our work and our progress in tropical medicine and global health. The second concept I think we need to bring us into our brave new world comes from another lawyer, Valerie Carr. She's a social activist. The lesson I have gotten from her is the inherent danger in the us and them mentality and a constructive approach to move past that in her book, See No Stranger. It actually fits quite nicely with the work of Heather McGee, but she makes it very personal. Puts it into the decisions and the actions we take every day. Understanding people that we think of as opponents, as others, as people like ourselves. Striving to know and understand how did they come to be in opposition to this. This approach will be very helpful to us as we try to understand the anti-science, anti-intellectual, and anti-vaccine thinking. Can we address the underlying issues and find constructive ways to collaborate and communicate? She has a very good TED talk. Uh, it's listed on the slide if you would like to learn more and uh, has this very interesting compass with how to start to address and reach out to people. And it's on the website, The Revolutionary Love Project. In her work, she demonstrates finding compassion for those who have hurt you and understandings, uh, those who have led them, what has led them to be who they are, and courage in confronting and communicating with people who think and act differently to find a new and more constructive path forward. Another great thinker of our time, Hans Rosling, who has sadly passed. <clears throat> He also fought the concept of us and them, the West and the rest, the developing world, the developed world. His quest to understand this dichotomy and how this misconception of this dichotomy drives poor decisions and planning and suffering has led to a unique life and legacy. Founding a project he, with his son called Gapminder, he challenges us to one, find your misconceptions, two, understand a changing world. And three, see the reality behind the data. If you have not seen his TED talk or been to the Gapminder website, you are really missing a treat. His visualizations of data and a drive to meaningfully communicate the data is inspirational. His message in the work of Gapminder is to show us that we all have big misconceptions about the world. These misconceptions are driven by our upbringing, our education, and the news. The first of these misconceptions he tackled in his work was the concept of us and them that is illustrated here on this slide. This dichotomy was based on the concept of this two hump graph you see on the, on the slide, very poor and rich. However, I want to point out that this data is from 1975. When we look at more recent data, we see one hump, that we have a world that's moved to the middle and the extremes are less defined and change the nature of the problems we are trying to solve. And who is there to solve them? I next move to the car salesman, Alan Mulally. Actually, he's the CEO of Ford, but you know, he sells cars. <clears throat> they were having a bad year, lost five, six billion dollars. Alan called his managers together to look at progress, challenges, and to rank issues that they were having, red bad, yellow concerning, green good. The managers all came together. Of course, they're with their big boss, the CEO. Not one had any red on their slides. This, of course, caught Alan's attention. How can we have lost $6 billion and have had no problems? This started a discussion and a debate, and soon the managers were sharing that there actually was quite a bit of red, but nobody wanted to show weakness or admit failure. 
However, it's only by opening up and bringing the problems and sharing solutions across teams and locations that things started to change. And only by looking at where there was trouble, sharing lessons learned and brainstorming new approaches, was the company able to turn itself around and get back on the road to success. This example, although we are not selling cars, but instead trying to save lives, shows us it's important to reflect openly on our challenges and course correct for the future, acknowledging what is not working. Okay, I went to see the John James Bond movie. It was the first movie in two years, so it was kind of exciting. <clears throat> you know, he always has cool toys, mostly that blow things up or help him get away quickly, but this time the plot included, and I don't think I'm ruining anything here, DNA encoded nanobots. Of course, they cause lots of trouble. <clears throat> but I found myself reflecting on this after the film, and I'm like, we already have these. So what if we had double O-A-S-T-M-H? Let us consider Oncocerca volvulus, the cause of onchocerciasis. This crafty parasite comes in unknown through the bite of a fly, matures and reproduces with the, without the host even knowing that it's there, living in the skin and causing uncontrolling itching. And you can't wash it off. You can't get it off because it's in your skin eventually gets into the eyes and slowly causes blindness. That one's pretty good. Chagas, this one's even better. The kissing bug bites you in your sleep and you inoculate yourself with the bug's feces by itching the wound. Gets into the body, hides in the smooth muscle, destroying your heart, destroying its ability to beat or your colon's ability to excrete. That one's pretty terrible human African trypanosomiasis, the bite of another fly. This one lives in your body, multiplying and finding a way to break through the blood-brain barrier into the brain where it disrupts your sleep patterns until you slowly go crazy and die. What about the high-speed chase of malaria in your bloodstream? Costume changes, it hides in the liver, then emerges, infecting your blood cells and bursting them from within. Schistosomiasis. You innocently contact a body of water, maybe getting a drink, washing your clothes, yourself, cooling off on a hot day. Little do you know that just by contact with that water, you've been infected with a deadly parasite that can kill your liver, destroy your bladder, embed eggs throughout your genital tract, causing bleeding, pain, and for women, increasing your risk of acquiring HIV and threatening your ability to be able to have a baby. Our stories are exciting and our parasites are tough and scary. We have less tuxedos and martinis, but not less exciting. International intrigue, overcoming adversity, global partnerships, millions of people's lives at stake. We need to tell our stories and have the world rooting us on to be victorious. How many will see this lecture? Okay, we have our dedicated members of ASTMH and all of the attendees, 4,000, 5,000 max, but we're not at James Bond levels yet. We have a gap. So what does this mean for ASTMH? It's now time for us to look at ourselves, at our work, our colleagues, our institutions, and see how we can overcome our limitations, challenge our assumptions, see our bias, and rebuild our systems in service of our mission and a brave new world. Why does it take 20 years to develop a new treatment for neglected tropical disease? Is that acceptable? Why do we accept that? Why does it take 20 years to get a life-saving vaccine that's used in a rich country into a country with less means? Can we look at a system that looks at need and not resources as the driver for action? We have a lot more to learn from each other. Bench scientist, entomologist, clinician, social scientist, advocate. We're all part of the solution and we all have a piece of the puzzle. ASTMH's mission, dedicated to reducing the worldwide burden of tropical infectious diseases and improving global health, generating, sharing scientific evidence, informing health policies, fostering career developing, recognizing excellence, advocating for investment in tropical medicine. This, this inspires me to more C words, communication, community, collaboration, and creativity. These are all inherent in our model and we need to continue to nurture them. So let's let the data guide us. We need to see where we have problems to see where we can work together to solve them. You see here the gap assessment done for the 20 disease areas in the WHO NTD Global Program. And you can see that we're not afraid of red. 
although perhaps we should be. We see from this gap assessment that there is a lot of work to do. And if we look at the areas that are highlighted, they range from diagnostic tools to partnerships and advocacy. We see that we need many skills and cross-sector collaborations to make this successful and turn some of these reds into green. Malaria and NTDs have similar scorecards with exercises with ALMA that look at national programs and their needs and challenges. Only by following progress and looking at cha the challenges ahead will we change the status quo. Ford, we have one up on you on understanding our challenges. <laughs> questioning our assumptions. One thing that it's easy to lose right now with everything that's going on is that the world is getting better. And here are some data from the work of Hans Rawling in the last 100 years. The quality of life has improved. In this bubble graph, each bubble is a country, different regions are different colors. America's green, yellow, Europe, blue, Africa, red, Asia. On the x-axis, you have the ex uh, life expectancy, and on the y-axis, you have income. But we see here that since ASTMH was founded in 1903, there has been a lot of pr progress. People started, people are earning more money and living longer, and that's good news. Women are having less babies. More of the babies are living. Extreme poverty continues to decline. The burden of disease has changed. This is data from 2016 from IHME and shows the global burden of communicable, non-communicable disease and injuries. These proportions have shifted significantly as global progress has been made. However, with this shift is not universal. We see here that the proportion of communicable diseases increases with decreasing wealth. Each of these figures, each of these little people rec represents a billion people. So you can have an idea of how many people live in each of these income ranges and how the proportions change. The importance of our work to the billion being left behind is profound, but we also need to keep an eye to the future and the challenges ahead. These changes will need to guide our work as a society as we look at the challenges of the future and be sure that we do not forget our mandate and leave that one billion behind who remain with communicable diseases holding them back or ignore the new challenges that lie ahead. I want to share with you an area where my own assumptions were questioned and challenged in the past year. Female genital schistosomiasis. No one cares. No one knows about FGS. It's one of the best kept secrets. It's not in medical education. It's not seen in textbooks. It's invisible except for those people that it affects. It has no dallies, so it doesn't exist in priority setting. It isn't reported so it's not prioritized in health systems, and it generates no recorded dallies. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in a perfect storm of neglect. People who work in sexual and reproductive health don't know about it. They never suspect a parasite. The symptoms mimic sexually transmitted infections with vaginal discharge, pain, bleeding, eggs from the parasite embedded in the genital tissue causing granulomatous inflammatory responses that lead to ectopic pregnancies, associated with a three to four fold increased risk of acquiring HIV. All for the want of an inexpensive treatment, often even free with drug donated by the Global Health Institute of Merck, KGAA, Praziquantel. I will show two stories in the past year that challenged assumptions. We got some funding from the Canadian Grand Challenges, from the Canadian people, with matching funds from many partners. The full project is called the FAST package. FAST stands for FGS, Accelerated Scale Together. There'll be a talk here at ASTMH on the whole project if you would like to learn more. <clears throat> In the case of the work, I will discuss the funding came from Merck Global Health Institute and from the Task Force for Global Health as part of the matched resources. First, we needed competencies. What do people need to know? We needed to set out what people need to know at each level of the health system. So our first approach was to do this the way we always do this. We have a WHO meeting. We gather a handful of global experts, a couple of people from endemic countries that we have enough money to travel. And then COVID happened. Global standstill. Now what do we do? We need to find a new way. So we worked online. Wow, did we learn. <laughs> we started by invent inviting the PIs, the principal investigators of the projects that had been funded recently from, by the Task Force for Global Health Coalition for Operational Research on NTDs, or CORE NTD. And this small group, word got out, and more people requested to be part of this workshop to develop these competencies, where we collaboratively established competencies for the uh, working practitioners 
in both kinds of health facilities and in the communities. We ended up with an amazingly diverse group of, uh, with 65 participants from 24 countries online. The online format allows us to work together to do small group discussions, then work on what we had been provided by that day, bringing it back to the group for further discussion. We worked over three weeks and we ended up with a much higher product, a higher quality product than we would have ever had before. And there's now a paper in the development of the competencies that's being published in the British Medical Journal of Sexual and Reproductive Health. The second was when we took these competencies and put it into a training. We put out a notice online that this training was going to be available in English and in French, uh, <clears throat> and included those that helped identify the competencies in the first place in that introduction. The course had 1,527 health practitioners that took time to apply. We were shocked. <laughs> you can see here that they came from many different levels of the health system and from many countries. We conducted the course in English and in French and in, over a three-week period, and unfortunately we could not train everyone. We could only take 20% of those that were interested in the format that we had. But it showed that people did care and they did want to know, and there was a huge demand and an interest in an area where we never suspected but hoped that it would be. The recent progress in NTDs has been born in questioning assumptions. In 20 12, the WHO published the 2020 roadmap for NTDs. This could have been just another document giving ambitious goals with little progress, but it wasn't. There was a response from the collective set of partners who were committed and required to commit something in order to achieve the progress that were set out in those 2020 goals. And that was codified in the London Declaration. This was a simple document, basically saying, I will do my part. And it started the partnership of uniting to combat NTDs. In this picture, you see nine competitor CEOs sitting with two ministers of health and the director general of the World Health Organization all aligned to do their part. And now, almost 10 years later, we see such progress. Since 2015, over 1 billion people have been reached annually to, with preventive chemotherapy for NTDs. We have a Guinness Book of World Records for the largest pharmaceutical donation ever in the history of the world. And 42 countries have eliminated at least one NTD by 2020. ASTMH is a part of this story. It was at ASTMH that the conversations over a coffee or a meal, a quick catch up in the hallway, that made the building blocks for the London Declaration and Uniting to Combat NTDs, where these challenges were discussed and solutions were found. There are many amazing accomplishments to ce celebrate. <clears throat> and actually, the top of this list is the malaria vaccine, now recommended by WHO. Many years of work and dedication made that come to light. And that's true for everything on this list. New oral treatment for human African trypanosomiasis with flexinidazole, the triple drug therapy for lymphatic filariasis, moxidectin, the first new drug for onchocerciasis, benzinidazole for Chagas, and post-exposure prophylaxis for leprosy that actually decreases the incidence of new cases. The other thing that is on this list that's shared is that ASTMH was part of the story. The science, the discoveries, the data were discussed and debated here. And they benefited from those hallway conversations, the chance meeting the opportunity to share and collaborate that the society provides. And that's part of what makes the society special. All of you and your work that will be shared over the next few days and the ongoing collaborations that will happen throughout the year. But the most amazing development is the development and deployment of a vaccine for COVID. I wanna remind you, March 11th, 2020, WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. In December, the first vaccine from Pfizer was authorized for emergency use, quickly followed by Moderna, J&J, &J, Sinopharm, and others around the world. By mid-October 2021, 6.8 billion doses have been administered. That is amazing. Now, is it equitably distributed? No, but this is an unbelievable accomplishment. 48% of the world has had at least one dose of vaccine. And we know, however, that it's only 3% in low-income countries. Time is cycling faster than ever, and I feel we judge ourselves too harshly. COVID has created a global experiment to bring equity in access to vaccines. 
When we think about access to life-saving vaccines like hepatitis B, or the one that I worked on for many years, Japanese encephalitis, these vaccines were not available to the populations who needed them most for more than 20 years. Here, with COVID, we may have success successfully had a vaccine available with worldwide in record-breaking time. Less than one year after the vaccine has first become available, it is used in at least 34 countries from this data. The most important thing is that we're having the debate, we're discussing, we're arguing, we're fighting for equity. A global voice raised to a global challenge. This is a new conversation. It's a shared experience. It's brought us together. COVAX and its successes are happening now. Should we be outraged and demand more? Yes, of course. The limitations in our infrastructure, the need to invest in health, so much work to be done. But I also think we should be proud, proud that we have come so far as a people and a planet. We should take a moment in the midst of all the action, the overtime, to breathe and realize we've come a long way. So some closing thoughts. We need to understand our history. We cannot let this challenge divide us. We must find solidarity dividend. We must grow stronger and more resilient as a human race. We need to rebuild trust and only by understanding each other and caring for each other can we find a place where trust can come forward again. We must strive to find ourselves and others and see no strangers. The world is different. We are evolving. Things are getting better and you can be part of that change. We need to tell our stories. We, need a, we are in a new chapter in history. We still have real challenges ahead, but together we are stronger. It will take us all to apply our talents, use the data, question the assumptions and the status quo. So my final slide, what does a brave new world mean to you? A world without malaria, a world without guinea worm, a world where everyone's contribution is valued and counts, a world where parasites don't determine your fate because of where you're born. What needs to continue, what needs to change, what needs to evolve, one step, one study, one piece, one handshake, one collaboration, one smile, one hallway conversation at a time. A world where opportunity is given to the best ideas regardless of who you work for, your country of origin, how much money your family made, how much money you made, what kind of house you lived in, what God you believe in, or who you find attractive. We need to find a way to nurture humankind to find solutions and overcome adversity and to find balance and joy. <laughs> you remember joy? It's still there. This is not over, whether it's the struggle to get vaccines, the threat of the evolving virus, the lingering economic hardships or psychological challenges that have come from isolation or the loss of a loved one. These challenges remain with us and we will have to see how we can overcome them because we will. And what kind of world will we build together in the process? Over the next few days, take the opportunity, it's harder in the virtual format, but all the more important, to acknowledge a colleague or a friend for demonstrating one of the three Cs. Showing compassion, honoring culture, demonstrating courage. Let's nurture and support one another and see things the way we want to move forward into our brave new world. Thank you. <laughs>